Well, I want to open up with a scripture here that uh, was on our video, sort of advertising for the Feast of Tabernacles. And I want to just open up with this because I think that this has relevance to not only this feast, but every feast, right? So it's in Colossians chapter 2, and it's in verse 16, and I'm going to read 16 and 17. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding festival or new moon or Sabbath, in which are shadows of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So I want to remind you that the reason that we can read that in the book of Colossians is because the Sabbaths are important. And the reason we know that is because we just read that they are a foreshadow of the things to come. Well, I want to tell you that today is a foreshadow of the very things that are coming. And the things that I'm going to tell you are really important to understand. And if you don't understand them, that's okay. But I would encourage that you seek out the things that I'm saying today that you would first, first and foremost, prove all things. So I speak from here but I ask that you go to your Bible and test everything that I speak today. That you test everything that I speak when I do speak at any time. I think it's important that we all test these things out for ourselves, but I allow for the Bible to interpret itself. I feel like that's the best method, you know that? Because the Bible will tell you exactly what it's supposed to say. We don't have to add or subtract from the Bible. We don't have to add in the traditions in order to make this a relationship between our Heavenly Father. You know, did you know that we could actually have a relationship with our Heavenly Father without any of the, the traditions, believe it or not? Now, I'm not saying that the, the traditions are bad. I'm just saying that sometimes they could supersede the actual biblical scripture. And so we have to be really careful as to how this is applied into our lives. You know, we walk around and, and we say we're believers, but a believer is someone that, is, that, that acts like a believer. Did you know that? You know, somebody that's compassionate, that is loving and kind. And there's going to be moments when you're, you're not. Did you know that? There's moments that you're just, you're just not going to be kind. And maybe you're upset with someone and you're just like, I'm not going to be kind today to you. Right? But then there's this conscience that sort of kicks in and you go, you know, I wish I was a little more kind. I probably shouldn't have said it the way I said it. You know, maybe I'll say it a different way next time. And all these are applicable to understanding the things um, and this journey, this faith within, within what we're doing here, this walk, right? It's a walk of faith in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? So I just want to tell you that the last great day is also understood as Shemini, Shemini Azaret. Shemini Ezeret is a, a, an understanding of eight and assemble, okay, or eight and gather. So he's basically telling us to gather or to assemble on this eighth day, which is also the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it sort of separates itself from the other days, as, as I spoke when, we, when I opened up service. Uh, and, and, and the reason is because we have seven days of feasting, And then we get to this like strange day, like if you were to count seven days, it doesn't, we don't have an eighth day. It repeats itself. And so it's important to understand where is is the eighth day coming from? What is the symbolism behind it? And what does the Bible actually tell us about this eighth day? Well, keep in mind that these are all shadows of things to come. And so I would encourage those that haven't been able to celebrate with us that maybe watch this video later to really test the waters as to what these days actually mean. Because I'm going to tell you that regardless if you're a believer or not, you will face the very things that are in this Bible. I don't care if you've been to church once, twice, your whole life. You will be held accountable to either one or the other of the meanings within this day, this this eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so I just want to welcome all of you to this last great day where we're going to muster up the energy to get through this service. And then we're all going to go home. We're going to fold up our tents. So whether or not you were in a tent or not, believe it or not, you were in a tent. Did you know that? You were folding, you're folding up these, 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 uh, physical tents because the meaning behind this day is that you're going to be indwelling. You're going to be, you're going to be full of the Holy Spirit to a point where you become eternal in a day of salvation. 
And that's what all of this points towards. So we're going to get into the message. Leviticus 23, verses 36. Let's turn over to that. Join me today when that, in, this, in this verse. So while you're turning over to it, um, you know, we're reminded that we are standing on sacred ground in this big, biblical calendar. This day also, while marked, marking the end of the seven-day feast, ushers in the most amazing promise of a new beginning through this eight-day feast. And so Leviticus 23, 36 says this, For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, and on the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly. So it is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. You know, if you were to read this, you'd probably think, what does this have anything to do with me today? How, how does this apply to my life today? Well, I would tell you that these fire offerings are fulfilled through the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who laid his life down at the cross for you. And so as you come before God, you place him before yourself by claiming him. And by doing so, you can offer up a suitable offering through his blood in order to be accepted and reconciled to our Heavenly Father. And so, but we take this day to remember the things not only of the biblical times and of history, but to be able to reckon the understanding of the significance of this day at a larger scale. So here the Lord commands a sacred assembly, a special time completely set apart from the other days within the week to meet with him. Hmm. This reflects the sacredness of what the eighth day actually means, Shemini Azaret, stands for a transition from the common to the eternal, from the earthly to the heavenly. You see, as many of you may be already aware, that the number seven within the Feast of Tabernacles, or in general, symbolizes completeness or perfection in Scripture. See, how many people knew that? I bet you almost every one of you understands that seven is the number of completion. Well, repeatedly, the number seven surfaces throughout the Bible. It surfaces throughout the Bible, broadening our understanding of its significance and the amazing sacredness associated with it. To grasp the true concepts within the eighth day, you have to understand what the seventh day is. There's no possible way you can get to the eighth day and understand it without understanding what the seventh day has in store for us and what it actually symbolizes, what it pointed towards, what it is used for. Why did God proclaim seven throughout the scripture? Why did it surface throughout the Bible so many times? Is it just a coincidence? Does this Bible have any value at all? Or is it possible that God's trying to send you a message? I would bet that God's trying to send you a message through this word, amen? And I would say that seven is relevant for all of us to understand before we can understand how to count to eight. I mean, I would think that a child, even counting one, two, three, he gets to seven. Well, he doesn't count to eight until he knows how to count to seven. I mean, that's just like the basic steps. So let's understand seven. I'm just gonna kind of give you a little glimpse of what seven is throughout the scripture in biblical history, right? So creation week, we all kind of know this one. Genesis 1 through 2, God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, in which, only, which, which now marks the completion of creation, but also establishes a perpetual day of rest, a new start every single week. Okay, I want you to start recognizing these patterns here. The walls of Jericho, Joshua 6, where the Israelites marched around the city of Jericho seven days with seven day evolving seven priests blowing seven trumpets before the walls fell down, which led to the new beginning of the Israelites in the promised land. You see the significance? Each time we talk about something like this, we see a completion and then we see a new beginning. You see the cleansing of Nehemon. In 2 Kings 5, Nehemon, suffering from leprosy, was told by Elijah to wash in the Jordan River seven times. After seven washes, he was healed, symbolizing not only physical cleansing, but also a spiritual journey that's, that was set before him, okay? Seven years of plenty and famine, spoken in Genesis 41. Joseph interpreted uh, the Pharaoh's dream, predicting seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. This not only prepared Egypt for the future, but also marked a new chapter 
for leadership and authority that Joseph took over. The seventh feast of God. Now here, here we go, seven feasts of God. Well, why seven? Why seven? Because they all have significance. And you know what? These feasts occur throughout the whole year and they include sevens within themselves. Okay, for, for example, we have the Sabbath counting seven days to a time of rest. And guess what? Then it starts over. See that? And then the Feast of Weeks, counting seven weeks after Passover. From the morrow after the Passover, we count seven weeks to what? The Jubilee, or to Pentecost, also known as Shavuot. All of the feasts mark the completion of a cycle and start the new spiritual beginning and an agricultural season that followed. Again, a new beginning. Okay? Sprinkling of blood on the day of, the, uh, of atonement, Leviticus 16. The high priest sprinkled blood on the mercy seat seven times symbolizing the complete atonement for Israel's sins, picturing Christ as the ultimate offering of sin that was done on the Day of Atonement. Seven lampstands and seven stars, Revelation 1.20, symbolizing the seven churches of the angels of the churches. These images emphasize the completeness of God's oversight and sovereignty over the church throughout the tribulation until his kingdom is fully recognized. The seven churches of Revelation in Revelation 1 through 3, Jesus our Messiah addresses seven churches. You remember those seven churches? Providing a complete assessment of their spiritual condition and calling for a renewal and repentance where needed in each church, he pointed out their flaws. He said, I'm proud of you over here, but you're over here. If you're the, the Laodicean, you're lukewarm. I want to spit you out. I want to vomit you out. If you're not serious about this, just go. Okay, I don't need you around if you're not serious about this. If you don't really want to take my grace, that's okay. Come back when you're ready. Come back when you're ready. And so leading to a promise of new blessings under a rule of obedience in his grace is what we're looking for, amen? So the 70 weeks of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27, this prophecy speaks of 70 weeks. 70 weeks, there it is again of sets of seven years decreed over the people of Israel in the holy city of Jerusalem to finish transgression, put an end to sin, and to bring everlasting righteousness to the period of culmin that culminates in a new covenant and the coming of the Messiah. How about seven seals in Revelation 6 through 8? The opening of the seven seals by, the Jesus, by Jesus in the book of Revelation brings to life the unfolding of divine judgments leading to the end of the, the, the current age. The breaking of each seal corresponds to the events on earth that symbolize the completion of earthly kingdoms and transition towards God's heavenly kingdom. You know, it just goes on and on. The seven trumpets in Revelation chapter 8 verse th through 11. The blowing of the trumpets, the seven trumpets, signals specific judgments upon the earth. These trumpets culminating in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God being, being proclaimed at reigning forever, signifying the progression, the progressive dismantling of the world's corrupt systems and establishments of God's rule. Seven thunders in Revelation chapter 10, 1 through 4, though not detailed specifically, the seven thunders symbolize a complete and perfect declaration of God's judgments, which are sealed under their appointed time emphasizing mystery and certainty of God's plans. How about the seven bowls of Revelation in chapter 16? The pouring out of the seven bowls of God's wrath completes the divine judgments against the ungodly. This series of catastrophic, catastrophic events leads directly to the final battle of Armageddon and the second coming of the Messiah, Christ, Jesus Christ, bringing in a new era. You know, I, these are just a few things that we can just touch on that symbolize the power of what God is trying to tell you. You know, if he just told you one time, seven. Okay. Sounds good. But if you're going to tell me seven times, and you're going to give me stories, and each time you give me the seven and the story, there's a renewal. There's a restart. There's a new beginning. I'm starting to get the message. And if we're not getting the message, maybe we need to open our ears, amen? Because he who has an ear will hear. You see, not everyone has an ear to hear. Some people are going to shut their ears to this, and that's okay, because at that final day, when things start to actually unfold, I'm going to tell you, you're going to open up your ears. And if you don't have any ears, you're going to see it. 
You're going to see it unfold because this is the truth. We're not hiding from the truth. There's no hiding from the truth. You can't hide from God either, by the way. You can do things behind doors or whatever you will, but God knows exactly what's taking place behind those doors. So we can't hide. We're not, God is not dumb and we're not smarter than God. So what, there's no absolute reason that we wouldn't understand that seven is the number of completion. And that after that is a new beginning. Well, each of these instances not only speaks to the biblical importance of number seven as a symbol of completion and fulfillment, but also it sets a stage for the subsequent new phase in our individual lives, the history of nations and the entire creation story through God's master plan, his blueprint that's laid out before us. Because all these Sabbaths and new moons are a shadow of things to come and the substances of Christ. Okay, so the reoccurring pattern of seven reinforces the eschatological promise that following the completion of the seventh period, such as the millennium, a new eternal period will begin. This will be a time of new heavens and a new earth where God will dwell with us as his people. You see, so unlike their temporary dwellings in these tents during the wilderness and, and wilderness journey, this will be a permanent and complete embodiment of God's presence among us, among them back then. See, here's the thing. We go camping during the Sukkot. We put up tents in our back office. I mean, we, we were accused by people looking at our backyards and saying that you were a refuge, refugee camp for the hurricanes. And that's okay. That is totally okay because we were getting a picture of what it's like to be in a temporary dwelling. You know, we are in these temporary dwellings, but you know what? Sometimes we can't fathom that. Did you know that? We think that we're, we're unstoppable. We're, we're, we, we think that there's no reason why we can't just do everything on our own, which means that we don't think that we're in a temporary dwelling. You see, because man has become smarter than God, what is good has now become evil. What is evil has become good. People are embracing even, let's say, the Halloween season. I mean, these churches are doing Halloween. What does that say? I don't think that that's good. I don't think that we should be embracing something that is evil. There's no possible way that we can make what is evil good but we can wipe it away and we can change what is evil and start to do good. And that's only through God's grace that that's possible. You see, otherwise it's not going to be possible. And as we can see the importance of the intricate cycle of seven in the book of Leviticus 25, 8 through 13, it also speaks also of the seven weeks that lead up to the Jubilee year from the time that we count from the Passover one of these meanings towards Jubilee is to give us a, it's, it's to, so counting towards this gives this mental picture to us, the reality that is, that is coming as to the future that connects us to the meaning of this day right here, the eighth day. You see, the Jubilee occurred every 50 years as a time of liberation or restoration for all inhabitants that were in Israel, debits, Whatever debts that you had were forgiven, slaves were freed, and lands were returned. So think about it like this. Bankruptcy. Where do you think it came from? And you know that you can only file bankruptcy every seven years? You think that's just a coincidence? Or do you think that they actually, it actually stemmed from the Bible principles? And so every seven years, someone would file bankruptcy and their debt is wiped out, symbolizing counting seven weeks towards 50, which would bring us to a time of Pentecost, but also pictures a time of Jubilee where we receive everything back that we once had. It resets society. You see that? The Jubilee occurred every 50 years. And it was this time of liberation and restoration. Both the Jubilee and the last great day mark a significant transition in the biblical writings. You see, signaling the end of an old cycle and the beginning of a new one. 
You see, the Jubilee celebrated every 50 years after seven sabbatical cycles resets society and society's norms. See, similarly, the last great day concludes the seven-day feast of tabernacles, initiating a time of reflection and renewal. See, each observance closes another routine period and brings back a new sanctified part of the lives of our, in our spiritual walk in this faith. You see, every single time we keep Feast of Tabernacles, we're reminded of these things and it all starts over. See, we're at the end of the fall feast. And guess what happens after this? We go all the way back to the beginning. Back to spring when it all starts over. And then we, are, we get to recount and remember the Passover, unleavened bread, Shavuot, and continues on. See, until we get back to this position again. And then we get to recount and remember these things. And you're thinking, why? Why do we have to keep rehearsing these things over and over and over again? Well, what if I told you that each and every time that God is talking to you through these holy days and through these times that are foreshadows of the things to come, we understand it on a larger scale, a larger scale, a larger scale, a larger scale. See, it's like putting the seed into the ground and he's burying you like this. And then each, each time you keep the feast, you start to sprout a little bit more. You start to understand a little bit more until the day that he finally harvests you up. And that pictures to a time that the eighth day pictures at the actual time of the event that it takes place. You see, these are pictures and shadows and stories that actually become reality and truth that connect us to these stories that we are rehearsing so that we understand God's plan through his master blueprint, you see? Super important to understand all of this because without it, we're gonna miss some of the details. So the eschatologically, the concept within the Jubilee year, this Jubilee in the Old Testament, it is seen as a very powerful image of the foreshadows and the ultimate redemption of freedom that comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Messiah. And just as the Jubilee year promised liberty and restoration to all inhabitants of the land, Christ's death extends, extends and covers, he literally covers the, and, and liber, the, the liberation from sin and the promise of eternal life to all who believe and are, and are obedient in his grace. And so what happens is he covers it. See, even in the picture of atonement, which he pictures and foreshadows, he is the fulfillment of that. He is the two Azazel goats. The one that died was for, they took lots and one went this way and was going to be a sacrifice. And that was the sacrifice that he pictured. He pictured that goat that died for the sins of all mankind. But then the other goat, the, the priest would lay his hands on it and it would go off into an uninhabited un, uh, place where no one knows. And it says that the sins were transferred to the goat and it would never go, it would never come back. It would go as far east as is to the west. Well, that's his resurrection. You see, your sins are removed permanently through the resurrection of the Messiah through the blood that was poured out and then through the resurrection is the fulfillment of both. He is the fulfillment of both goats, not one, both. So in this whole atonement covering, he is the covering. You see, because just as the boat, the, the ark of Noah was sealed up with pitch, did you know that's the same Hebrew word? He pour the same Hebrew word that is for pitch. So he covered the boat so that it would not be thrashed by the raging waters so that it would be sealed. And in that, Noah, his family and animals had salvation. You see, he seals us, he covers us with this covering so that we have liberation from sin and a promise of eternal life to all who believe and are obedient through his grace. You see, similarly, the last great day observed at the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles looks forward to the ultimate gathering of God's people. This day concludes the final and grand assembly that will occur at the end of the millennial period, making the start of the new creation. 
And just as the festival day celebrates the completion of the harvest, it also points to the time when God will gather his people into a renewed heaven and new earth, initiating an internal era of peace and divine fellowship. You see, then you have the eighth day. And this is not just a continuation, but a new creation, a fresh start or a beginning. It is powerful. It is symbolic of God's grace extending beyond the bounds of completion into the realm of new beginnings that, the re, the, that really only, we only know a very little about. That's the truth. We don't know a lot about it. We just know that it's going to be something completely new that we have never seen before and we should be excited about it because it speaks of a time that there will be no more crying. There will be no more of the hurt that is taking place within this world because I'm gonna tell you, if you want to look over here and try to tell me you don't face these things in your life, you're a liar. Every one of us feels pain in our lives and we're persecuted by the world every single day. And we try to walk strong. We try to stand up tall. Uh, look at me. I'm, nothing's going on in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need anything. I don't need anything in my life. Well, that's not true. See, the truth is we need people in our lives. We need things in our life. We need God in our life. We need God in our life. And if we don't think we need him in our life, you're going to find out you need him in your life. Did you know that? Hmm. Mankind will try to do it themselves. prophesied and many many people will not live we haven't seen a war yet not like the one we're going to see but it's only serious to people that value it we only value what we value I like to say this because it's true the only reason that, that we can stand here in church and take time for an assembly, a holy time, where we proclaim it to be holy is because we value what the Bible has to, st to say. And by that, we honor our Heavenly Father. We honor what Christ did on the cross for us. And so there's value in this. There's value in it. You see, Revelation 21.5 says this, Then he who sat on a throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write for these words, Write for these words are true and faithful. They're true and faithful. As we navigate through God's plan for our lives, we reach a point where the future may seem completely uncertain for us. How many people here have felt uncertain at one point in your life? Okay, I'm going to raise my hand for sure, okay? Because there's, there's no possible way as a human being that we don't feel completely uncertain at times. Did you know that in your weakness, God is made strong? See, our weakness is actually a good thing sometimes because make, it makes him strong. Because he carries us. He carries us along the way. And when we're in, our, when we're in that, that, that spot that we're the lowest and we feel like there's nothing else happening in our lives, like that there's, nothing, there's no possible way I'm gonna get through this, perhaps, I don't know what it is, alcohol. Alcohol seems to be a big thing. And in COVID, you know what? It took over society. So everybody runs to the bottle because they're looking for answers. Well, that's not the answer, unfortunately. But guess what? It's a numbing agent. And people run to alcohol for a numbing agent. People run to drugs for a numbing agent because they're trying to escape the world. They're trying to escape their problems. They're trying to find an avenue out instead of following the direct path that's set before them within the Bible. But they can't embrace the Bible. They don't know how. They don't know what it says. They don't care about it. How do they find God at this point? How do they find God? Well, did you know that it proclaims that they might not until the end? 
You see, not everyone finds God, not everyone values God, not everyone values the Bible. And that's why there's all these verses and scriptures that talk about narrow is the way that's difficult and few choose it. But wide is the way that leads to destruction and many follow in that direction. Or how about the first and second resurrection? How come it's called the great white throne like the, 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 the large resurrection, right? It's like the multitudes start to come out of their graves. See, we have these two harvests. The first fruit harvest is in the beginning of the year, symbolized in the Bible as the first fruits, which is the barley harvest, which is the smaller of the harvest. But then at the end, you have the fall harvest, which is the wheat, which is the larger of the harvest. And that's what pictures the second resurrection. In the second resurrection, it says if you have no part in the first resurrection, you're going to be in the second resurrection. Well, let's read about what some of the things, what does it tell us about these resurrections? Do we even understand these resurrections? Do we understand what the Bible has in store for us in these resurrections? So biblically, the number seven symbolizes completion. The eighth day following a complete cycle of seven days signifies the start of something new beyond the original completion. It's throughout the scripture. It represents the transcendence of the natural order and the beginning of a new phase of what is completely unknown sometimes throughout the scripture. Leviticus 22 verse 27 says this, when a, lamb, when a, when a calf and a lamb or a goat is born, it must remain with its mother for seven days. From the eighth day on, it will be acceptable as an offering made unto the Lord. Did you know that an animal has to be eight days old in order to be offered up? So it, it goes through the cycle of seven, which is completion. And then on the next one, it's new. It's a new beginning. It's this like new creation. Or how about this in Genesis chapter 17, verse 12. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised including those born in your household or, or, or household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. So that means that a child is circumcised on the eighth day, so you go seven days of a time of completion, and then on the eighth day, a child is circumcised and now becomes what is called biblically clean before the children of Israel within the camp. These are all biblical uh, facts within the Bible. Did you know that God gave a male uh, vitamin K, the largest amount of vitamin K on the eighth day so that the blood would coagulate during the circumcision? All of this was planned out from creation. It wasn't just something that just took place. All of this was for a reason. So, in the context of the Feast of Tabernacles, the eighth day marks the end of one celebratory cycle and ushers in a fresh, sanctified time dedicated to God. All right, let's turn over to John chapter 7. Let's really start to understand how this unfolds. You see, we have to understand seven before we can understand eight. In John chapter 7, verse 37... It says, on the last day, the great day of the feast, the eighth day, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is a very well-known scripture. Many people understand it or know it. Jesus, our Messiah, is proclaiming through this verse that anyone who believes in him will not only be satisfied themselves, but will also become a source of spiritual life or, ref or refreshment for others. Because the, quote, rivers of living water metaphorically represents the Holy Spirit that powers us and the outpouring that goes out through us to other people. See, Isaiah 44, verse 3, it says, For I will pour out water on him who is thirsty, 
and, flo- and floods on the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Here on the last great day, Christ is, his invitation was absolutely 100% clear. He is the source of eternal life, the answer to every longing and the beginning of the new life that never ends. You see, the resurrection is the expression of this new beginning because it captured the end of mortal life and the start of eternal transformation and existence. That's what this day is picturing. You see, the resurrection on the last great day is not just a return to life, but the beginning of a completely new life. A glorified state of existence free from the limitations of sufferings of earthly life that we live in today. Think about that for a second. If you could live a life where you have no more hurt and no more pain, how would you, would you like that? Do you want that? Well, guess what? You can't earn it. I just want to tell you right now. Sorry to be the bummer. You can't earn it. But God can give it to you. And guess what? It's a free gift. And did you know that most don't even want it? Because, you know, the saying is, is nothing good is free. Nothing good is free. Maybe that's false. Maybe that's false because I'm going to tell you right now that he gives us something. He gives us grace. He gives us mercy. He gives us compassion. He gives us hope and eternal life that we can look forward to. And guess what? It's free. It's absolutely free. Because the debt's already been paid. See, the debt's already been paid in Yeshua. Jesus Christ, he already paid the debt for you. Do you believe that? Because it's true. It's true. God wants us to be obedient in his grace. He wants us to follow through with the instructions, his commands, these desires that he has for you, but he wants you to do it in his grace because you cannot do it by your deeds. You cannot earn your salvation by any means. You are not not earning eternal life. If you try it, you'll fail. We only receive it through him. What an awesome God, amen? Revelation chapter 22, let's turn over there. Revelation 22, we're gonna read one through five. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on the other side of the river was the life, the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You know something? This is called the Etzayim, the tree of life. And if you go into a synagogue, they have a Torah scroll that is leaning up. You see, this is the tree of life that the river is flowing around. And it says that the, the, it says that the, 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 the leaves are for healing to the nations. Well, what if this right here is the leaves that heals the nations right here? You see that? See, it's very simple. It's just what we think and how we think about things. See, these are the the leaves that heal the nations. This Bible right here, you can believe it or not, but I'm gonna tell you, when you are on your deathbed, you ask for it. When you are on your deathbed, you start to ask someone, what happens after you die? Because I wanna know I'm scared. Right now I'm scared because I'm actually in my, I'm in my bed and I know that I'm dying. And I need some healing, so I need you to tell me about what the future holds for me. I need you to tell me what this Bible says. Can you tell me? I need to know. I need to know because I'm scared. 
Why do we get, why do we have to get to this point in our lives? Why do we have to get to this point where we get to the point where we're on our deathbed and that's when we say, what is going on? What is going on? I didn't know that I was ever going to be here. I was feeling good yesterday, but today I'm, I'm not feeling very good. I'm not feeling the same as I used to or do the way that I did yesterday. I need the healing. I need these pages. I need the, the, the leaves to heal me. I need it. See, I need the tree of life. Well, it's right here. It's a free gift. Not only that, but he will light your path. You see, he's given you the light that you need to walk in life so you don't stumble. Because I'm going to tell you, if you don't have God in your life, you have no hope. People walk around like they do, but they don't. It's all a facade. They're scared. Behind, behind that smile, behind the grins, they're scared. They're freaked out of their mind. They have no idea what life is about. And we have very little knowledge of what life is about, even reading this word. Can you imagine not having this word, guys? How would this feel not having the hope here? We know what this Bible says. We know the power of what it can do. Do you believe in miracles? Good, because if you don't, you'll never see one. You see, because you'll never give God credit. You'll never give God credit. You won't know what a miracle actually looks like when you see it. You know that Pentecost can be seen as the first fruits? A moment just as the festival celebrates the, the first harvest, the giving of the Holy Spirit, and it represents the first installment of God's promise, a taste of what is to come in its fullness for our future. You see, do you remember when the Holy Spirit fell on the people and they received the Holy Spirit? Well, how did we get there? We counted seven weeks. See, we counted seven weeks. These are a shadow of things to come, the substances of Christ. See, we counted seven weeks to get to Pentecost, to get to Shavuot. And what happened after that? The Holy Spirit was given. But it was a very small measure of the Holy Spirit compared to what you're going to get. You see, what you're going to get is the full measure of the Holy Spirit that's going to make you eternal. These tents that are temporary are going to leave, and we are going to be embodied by Christ fully, and we are going to be eternal in heaven. We are going to reign in heaven with our God. Amen? See, that's the difference between Pentecost and what it looks like to receive the full measure of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The last great day points to the ultimate culmination of God's plan, the full realization of his kingdom when all of us as believers will be resurrected or transformed into eternal bodies fully and forever permeated by the Holy Spirit. You know, it says if you have the, 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 the Holy Spirit of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. So we know that we have, uh, we have what we need if we ask God to supply, and he does, by the way. We live our lives through his spirit and through the Holy Spirit that he gives to us. But think about the time that he completely fills you up with the Holy Spirit to a point where this fleshly body leaves and you are now eternal. That's pretty exciting. See, because we know that we have a bigger hope. We, have, we know that we have more to look forward than to all the hurt that we get when we go into the world and when we live this life because we're gonna be disappointed by the things that are of this world at, at times. Sure, there's beautiful things, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I enjoy life and the beauty of life, but there's times that you're gonna be very disappointed. You're gonna be so disappointed with the way people disappoint you or people betray you. Guess what? Your God will never betray you. He'll never forsake you. He'll always be there for you. But we have to accept his grace. You see, this is a promise of eternal life where we will be drinking from the water of life in means of an everlasting communion with God. Completely free from the limitations and sufferings of the current world that we are living in right now in the present age. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, that's relevant for us today, even right now. 
But on a larger scale, this verse speaks to the image of a new beginning and eternal life discussed in the symbolism of this particular day, this eighth day. It reassures us that, that Christ, and as his believers are already experienced, we're already experiencing this first fruits of transformation, meaning like the first of the first fruits. See, on Pentecost, we got a little bit of the fruit, a little bit of this transformation, but we look forward to its full realization in God's eternal kingdom. You see, it's a, there's a difference between the two. See, the eighth day is a symbol of new beginnings and beautifully parallels the resurrection of the dead. It speaks to the time when all who sleep in the dust will awaken, some to everlasting life, others to judgment. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 2. This resurrection is not merely a return to life, but a step into completely new existence, eternal and glorified, free from the shackles of morality. Daniel, chapter 12, verse 2, I'll read it. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Think about that for a second. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. You see, in Revelation 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You see, let's, let's, let's understand the, the timeline. Six days of creation, the earth was made in six days. But on the seventh day, something happened. God ceased from his work. You see, for six days he created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and proclaimed it as a rest. Well, let's look at this from, a, you know, from eschatology. So from Genesis to Revelation, we can understand something a little differently. So now seven days is 7,000 years. You see, we have 6,000 years until Christ's return. Well, we're getting close. We don't know exactly when. We could live another 50 years, 80 years. I don't know. I'm not going to proclaim the time. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that he's coming back because it says not even the Son of Man knows. Why would I tell you? Why would I tell you? But I'm going to tell you, we could actually prepare and be aware of the times and seasons that we're in. But like, just, just, just stay focused. Do, you, do what you need to do in God's grace. Just be obedient to him in his grace and allow for his mercy to be bestowed upon you. And don't worry, let the stuff just, let God do his part. Let's just let God do his part, amen? Yeah, let's let God do his part. And so for that, thousand years after he returns. So six days is 6,000 years. And then he returns, you see. And for a thousand years, the ones that are raised first in the first resurrection are raised with him. So it's this picture, this mental picture, this metaphorical understanding of that we're going to raise with him. So we're for, during that thousand years after the 6,000 years, we're going to be reigning with him. But guess what at this time? There's going to be people still on earth giving in marriage and having children. And guess what? Some people didn't raise from the ground. The only ones that raised from the ground at this point are the first fruits. Everyone else is still dead in the ground. And there's people still married having children. And this is for a thousand years. And during this time, Satan is bound up. Satan is now locked up for a thousand years. And after the thousand years, okay, what happens? And so this is, I'm trying to give you this timeline as we continue. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 50 through 52, speaking of the first resurrection. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you the mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment of twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Very, very common scripture here. It's called the resurrection chapter. Okay, well right here, those who take part in the first resurrection are considered blessed and holy. What's important to understand is that they are protected from the second resurrection. 
So let's remember this. That we are protected from the second resurrection if you're in the first resurrection, which is the final judgment where the unrighteous are eternally separated from God. In other words, those in the first resurrection won't face this judgment. Listen to the quote. Over such the second death has no power. They have already been declared righteous and will live forever with Christ. So in the first resurrection, you are already raised with Christ. So then it says that you have no part in the second resurrection, which is the resurrection to judgment. Which means you don't see judgment because you're already raised. Because in Revelation 20, verse 11 and 15 through 15, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face on the earth and the heaven fled away, and, the, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, the small, and the great standing before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works and by the things in which were written in the books. And the seas gave up the dead who were in it, and the death of Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works." each one according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, let's really think about this for a second. These two resurrections share a distinction between the believer. How is this? Who is part of the first resurrection and experiences the millennial reign with Christ as in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? and the general resurrection of the dead, and which includes all others, and leads to the final day of judgment. So I'm going to tell you, if you're in the first resurrection, you don't face judgment. What does that tell you, though? We just baptized somebody today. You know, we just, we just went through the ceremonial washing of baptism, and God, he was there present giving Tucker a blessing. So if we're not judged in the second resurrection, when are we being judged, church? Possibly now if you know, don't you? See, if you know and you've committed to God and you've, you've been baptized into his word, you're being judged now. And so it's so precious that we have to understand that we need his grace, we need his mercy, and we cannot do this by ourselves. That our deeds will, will lead to dead works. But this is important to understand because if we don't understand these concepts, we don't understand the resurrections. So this understanding is developed through the framework of the first resurrection as a blessed hope for the faithful who escape the second death and the second resurrection as leading to the judgment that determines eternal death. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 3 through 4 says this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires that all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why did I read that? Because well, I want to tell you that our God is a just God, and he's fair. So I'm going to ask you this. Do you think that if you're in the second resurrection, well, let's, let's just put this into perspective here. If a child that never even got a chance to live and, 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 and know God, and to be baptized, how is he going to not have another chance? He's going to have a second chance. It says that he judges them. He doesn't condemn them all, he judges them. Listen to what he is. For this is a good and acceptable in this, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. What does 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says? That the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but to the long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, we, we serve a God that is so loving and so kind that he wants everyone to have an opportunity, and even if they're in the second resurrection, they'll come before God, not man. They'll come before God and God will choose whether or not that individual either is condemned to the lake of fire or they're resurrected to life. You see, judgment 
as envisioned on the great white throne judgment day of second resurrection serves as the final closure to human history as we know it and the initiation into a new eternal order. Again, Revelation chapter 20, 12 through 13, and I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne. The books were opened. Another book was opened in which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded into the books. And the sea gave up the dead and that were in it and the death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And the, each person was judged according to what they had done. The passage speaks to all individuals, not part of the first resurrection, because they had no judgment coming to them. They're being judged now. Judged according to their actions and, rec and recorded in the books with their fate determined, so their fate determined at this final time of judgment, when they step before the throne in the second resurrection, this determines their fate. And guess who determines that? God. By the way, God is a loving God. Check it out. It's God's justice to give someone a fair assessment based on their deeds. See? Just as he was compassionate to the people of Nineveh when they were wicked and completely wicked and deserved death, he said, I'm going to give you mercy. I'm going to give you mercy. It shows his compassion. It shows that he cares and he wants everyone to come to repentance. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Psalms 25, 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. Psalms 89, verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Isaiah 30, verse 18, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Are we getting the picture? Do you view God as a God that will not give others opportunities to live again? Because some people teach that. Some people believe that if you're not in the first resurrection, you're in the second resurrection, and in the second resurrection, you're done. You're doomed. You're done. You're gone. You don't get another chance. I don't believe that the Bible teaches that. We just read some verses right here. Does it sound to you like it, they're just condemned? No. It says they're judged. They're judged, just like you're being judged today. Because if the word judge meant that you're doomed, then you're doomed today right now. But you have a Messiah. And if they embrace the Messiah at the second resurrection, perhaps they didn't know the Messiah, they'll get an opportunity to know the Messiah and to embrace Messiah in their life as well. And then God will be the one to choose whether or not they live or die. You see, this last great day can be understood as a small scale of God's overall plan for humanity. Just as this day follows the completion of the Feast of Tabernacles, so too does God's ultimate plan involve a final resolution followed by the inauguration of a new heavenly order, a new creation where, I quote, death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. You see, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, 1 through 7, he says, Now I saw a new heaven and earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacles of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. This is the final conclusion of what it is to tabernacle with God. We're talking about a complete reset, a jubilee like you've never heard of before in your life, where we will have an opportunity to tabernacle with God, not in these temporary tents, but with one that is eternal that he gives you. Amen? You see, God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away, and then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write for these things. These words are true, and they are faithful. And he said to me, It is done. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give of the fountain of the waters of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my children, my son. Does it sound to you like God is a mean, Does he sound like he's a mean God? Do we serve a God of aggression? I mean, we get what we, we, uh, what we deserve sometimes, no doubt. He disciplines us as his children, just like we discipline our children. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. He does it out of love. Because it's the loving rebuke is better than hidden love. Amen? You see, God, God actually loves humanity. He loves his creation. I mean, he created us. And he wants us all to live. He wants all of us to live. But not all of us are going to live. You see, those who are in the first resurrection will not see judgment. But in the second resurrection, it's going to determine your fate. And God is the one that judges. But guess what? You're going before a judge that is just. We just read a bunch of scriptures. He's just. He's fair. He's loving and he's kind and compassionate. I mean, he would have to be to give his only begotten son so that we could all live. Think about that. So, that, so all of that would picture to just wiping out a bunch of mankind. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense at all. No, people are going to get an opportunity to live again. Even if they're in the second resurrection, but there's going to be a lot that don't. It's going to be a sad time and a sad day. But uh, this is what all of this pictures and it says in Revelation 22, 16 through 17, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You see, it's not, it's not, unaffordable. See, that's what it comes down to is it's not unaffordable. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. And it's probably the, I mean, I mean, it is the best gift you're going to ever get for free, no doubt. You see, it's something that sometimes is not tangible not obtainable for some. And sometimes you wonder why. Like, why, why do they not see this, Lord? And why are they not interested in the values that are within these, this, this, these scriptures? Why do they not value the tree of life and the healing of the, of the leaves? Why? Well, that's for God to know. You see, there's some things we just don't have to uh, worry about. We do our part as, as a disciple, as an ambassador of his, and we let him do the rest. Amen? Well, with that said, I love all of you guys, and these, these days picture amazing things. And I, I hope to be in the first resurrection, and I hope to see you there. That's what all of this pictures. But at the end, don't worry. Do your part. Live in his grace and allow him to do the rest. Amen.